Buying a new camera can be daunting, especially if you've never had to get one before. There are so many models, makes, options, specs, and loads of just numbers being thrown around that it can be very easy to just get lost in the noise of all of these specs and through no fault of your own, end up prioritizing features which in the real world might not be all that useful to you. And in today's video, I'm gonna go through some of these features and explain why I personally think you shouldn't worry about them too much. Now, let me just be very clear. This is mainly for street photographers, landscape photographers, and people who do this as a hobby. If you're doing sports photography or you're at the Olympics now, then chances are, this video might not be for you. Also for this video, I am walking along the river from Battersea Power Station and just gonna see how far I can get. I reckon Tower Bridge, something around there will be good and take some pictures, which I'll of course show you. Burst mode has its time and place. However, more and more brands are pushing extremely high burst rates as these hero features for everyday cameras that most of us would buy. And to be honest with you, anything over 10 or even 15 frames a second, in my opinion, for the average photographer is just not gonna be that useful. As an example, for my street photography, the most I would ever use is around eight frames a second. And for me, that's enough to get the right moment of a particular subject walking through a frame. The only time I've used more than eight frames a second is around 15 frames a second, taking photos of some seagulls flying around Tower Bridge. And that was probably once, maybe one more time. Not to mention that if you want to make the most of these high burst rates, you will need a UHS-2 memory card because if you don't have one, then you will lag so much. So you'll take your 20, 30 photos and then your camera will spend ages recording them to your card. So then you'll end up with a locked camera. So if you do see another photo, you can't take it because your camera's locked. So having an expensive UHS-2 memory card is almost a must if you want to make use of the 20 or 30 frames a second that your camera comes with. Now, does all this mean that high burst rates are pointless? Not really. If you're an aspiring wildlife photographer, sports photographer, motorsports photographer, then yeah, high burst rates are very good for you and you will need them. Just keep in mind the extra faff that comes along with them, such as high speed memory cards and a little bit more storage. So to summarize, if your camera comes with them as standard, then great, you know, it's better to have it than not, I guess. However, I wouldn't prioritize it as a feature that I would certainly spend any extra money on unless I absolutely have to. Similar to burst rate, focus points is another number that gets usually thrown around by manufacturers to entice people, claiming the more focus points are the better and you should spend more money on a camera with more focus points. Now, what is a focus point? Well, within the camera, when it's looking for somewhere to focus, it has a certain number of points where it can acquire focus. In theory, the more focus points you have, the more accurate the autofocus system can be. Therefore, what you want to be in focus has a higher chance of being in focus. The question is, the more focus points you have, does that really make it better? Now, if we compare a camera from, let's say, 10 years ago, which might only have 15 or 20 focus points, with, let's say, today's camera, which is, let's say, the X-T4, with 400 focus points, will you see a difference? Obviously, you will. However, if you then take a camera with 300 focus points and then compare it to a camera with 500 focus points, again, unless you are in a very niche category, the real-world difference will be negligible if any at all.
Now, another thing to keep in mind is that just because your camera comes advertised with 500 focus points, it doesn't mean that the mode you use the most will use all of those focus points. So for example, the X-T4 Fuji comes advertised with 425 focus points. However, the mode I use most of the time only uses 117 of them. So when you're buying a camera and you're looking at these specs, do a bit of research because the headline highlighted um, focus point count might not even be used by you at all. So does all this mean that high focus points are useless? The short answer is no. As with previous example, it all depends on your use case. If you are into sports or nature or wildlife or you're going on a safari and you want to track lions with your like, like an 800 mil lens, then yeah, having a higher focus point count will definitely help you. For street photography, general photography, and basically everything I do, I've only used 117 and I've never really had any issues. Now this next point does really depend on your use case. Before going any further, what do I mean by extended ISO? Basically, if your normal camera ISO range is between 160 or 100, which is base, to around about 12,800, which is around about average, then that's your normal ISO range. Extended ISO, as the name suggests, goes above that, and some cameras can go up to 50,000 and even into six figures. Camera companies will push these very high figures to you and tell you that by having such a huge extended ISO, you can see in the dark or into the future or something. And sure, a higher ISO will definitely let you shoot in lower light. However, what is the price that you pay for that? Well, here is a photo taken at base ISO. Here's a photo taken at the maximum of 12,800 ISO, at least on the X-T4. And here's a photo taken at the maximum extended ISO on the X-T4, which I forgot, but I'll write it here. As you can see, the photo is virtually unusable. Now, let me be very clear with what I mean by unusable, because that depends on the scenario. Unusable, I mean as an artistic, photograph as a photo that I am taking, not because I want to spy on my neighbour who's stealing my recycling bin, but because I want a nice clean photograph at the end of it. If your job is in MI5, you're a spy, then maybe having such a huge extended ISO will definitely benefit you at the cost of image quality. However, if you care about having the cleanest possible files and the nicest looking images, then you will never ever shoot at these huge extended ranges. Therefore, my question is, well, do you really need to pay for them? And finally, we have features which I honestly think are added to cameras just to make the spec sheet look a little bit bigger. Because I can't imagine any real photographer using things like toy effect or miniature or single colour. I mean, sure, if you're buying a toy camera or if you're buying a very entry-level camera aimed at the masses, then yeah, I guess those features belong there. But when you're buying a pro-level camera, at least like an X-T4, and you get those features bundled in, it just seems like a little bit you know, of a spec sheet bump. Um, same can be said for features that we would find useful, like HDR or Pano, disappointing. Um, HDR mode in every camera I've ever owned has always been a letdown. It would be better to just take one photo and play with the shadows and highlights, or if you want to be perfect, take two, three photos with different exposures. As for the pano mode, I think they're just trying to copy the iPhone and they can't because the iPhone is just so much better at doing pano. And again, if I was semi-serious about getting a decent pano photo, I'll just take a bunch of photos and stitch them in Lightroom. So if you do see these features on the spec sheet, don't assume 
they replace a proper technique of doing it manually and certainly don't think they're worth the money that they might be asking for that camera if a different version without those features costs a little bit less. So that's all for today's video, I hope you found it useful. Please remember this is my opinion based on my current circumstances, who knows maybe in 20 years time I'll be using 58 frames a second to take photos of wildlife if there's any left, but that's a whole separate topic. Anyway, thank you as ever and I'll see you in the next video, bye.